Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Chip Conley, and I am not Bill Clinton, and I'm not the Dalai Lama. And I was third choice of Meng to actually introduce him today. <laughs> but, but I am incredibly honored to be here as a friend of Meng and a just a huge fan of him and his work. Um, in preparation for being here today, I decided to Google Meng and search inside yourself. And the first thing that came up was Meng Stupiditis, which I didn't know that you had this website, Meng. But he has a website called Meng Stupiditis, and there's actually a little point in that website where he says, there's a picture of him, and it just says, I'm just a random generic guy. And there's a picture of him and Barack Obama. So I don't know. <laughs> I actually think, although it doesn't say it on his, on his website, I think the symptom of Meng Stupiditis is Excessive need for getting your photo taken with famous people. I don't know about you, but thats I think that's one of Meng, Meng's more endearing qualities. Um, I think he should have named the book How to Be a Jolly Good Fellow. Uh, but what I love about Meng more than anything is his combination of humility and humor. And in looking at that website, the Meng Stupiditis website, there was a, a wonderful little poem that he wrote last month called The Not Difficult Path. And I'm going to read it to you very quickly. It's very short. And then we'll have him up here. Meng says, With calm mind, I see my true nature. With jolliness, I open Dharma doors. With open heart, I welcome my Buddha. And with non-doing, I enlighten the world. Meng, come please enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I, I like to stand behind the podium so you can see less of me. It's, it's always an improvement when you see less of me. <laughs> so uh, welcome. Oh, the clicker is here. Okay. Um, thank you, Chip. Chip is, is a wonderful, beautiful human being. And it's always nice to be introduced by you. Thank you. So I want to start by telling you a, a famous Zen parable. And it's a parable of the guy on the horse. Right? So, um, so the guy, some guy was, was like riding on a horse, and he was passing by some guy walking on a street, or standing on a street. And the, the guy standing on the street asked the guy on the horse, so rider, where are you going? And the guy on the horse says, well, I don't know. Why are you asking me? You should be asking the horse. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> So, so this is a parable about our emotional lives. So that the horse signifies our emotion, our emotional life. And we usually, we allow our horse to take it, to take us where the horse wants to take us. We don't think we have any control, right? But in fact, I want to tell you today that we do have control. And today's, uh, the book in general, and today's talk is about mastery. Uh, but first, I think b even beyond, like, like like allowing the horse to take, take it where you want. I think more, most of the time we end up like this, right? We are like, the horse is dragging us, right, randomly. And especially if you are experiencing emotions like fear, nervousness. For example, you have to speak in front of a crowd of, I don't know, 100 people and you're going on YouTube. For example, that could be nervous, <laughs> nerve breaking, right? I don't know, I'm just, that's a random example. <laughs> or, or anger, right? And, and things like that. Then you feel like, I, I've, I have no control, I lost control, and then it's just, you like you're being, being dragged along. Search inside yourself is uh, the idea that you can go, you can improve on that. So the first level of improvement is going from that to this, right? <laughs> Looking cool, right? So, <laughs> and smoking a Marlboro, right? But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, looking cool. Like, so, so you're on the horse and you don't just look cool, you, you get to at least have influence on where you want the horse to go, right? And to a certain degree, you get to control the horse. The horse is still has its own mind. It's in the same way our emotional process has, has its quote unquote own mind, but you get to control it, guide it where it wants to go. However, it gets even better, right? You can go from even from this skillfulness into this mastery, right? Like, like you can stand on the horse and so on. Right? I wish the gas shades are here and they, I think they will appreciate this. Right? So, so this is, emotional mastery. 
the question then is, what does emotional mastery look like in the context of work? And I think that emotional mastery manifests itself in the type of statements we make about ourselves in relation to our emotional skills and, and success. So, oh, the, the gadgets are here. Okay, I just continue talking. Uh, <laughs> yes. For example, the example of those statements. We tell ourselves, if I have strong self-awareness, no, I will be so successful. Right? If I can remain calm and confident in crisis, I will be so successful. If I can create optimism and resilience, I will be so successful. Right? And if I can understand people better, and I can instinctively like people, and I can help people like me, no, I will be so successful. So all these qualities I just talked about, confidence, awareness, optimism, and so on, they come under the umbrella of emotional intelligence, which is defined as this. Uh, the ability to monitor one's own and other's feeling, to discriminate among them, and most importantly, to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. So this is emotional intelligence. The good news, the good news is that these qualities are skills. And like all other skills, these skills are trainable. So emotional skills are trainable. Emotional intelligence is trainable. So that's the good news. However, there's better news. Yeah, the thing with me, there's no, there's no bad news. It's good news and better news. Which is why people like me, I mean, in addition to my good looks. <laughs> the better news is that we found running Search Inside Yourself that those skills are trainable to a, to a meaningful degree in as little as seven weeks. Seven weeks, you can train to a large degree of those skills. And this is what Search Inside Yourself is about. Search Inside Yourself is uh, an EI or Emotion Intelligence Curriculum for adults. And uh, a cartoon to show what that looks like. Okay. The question then is, how do you, hello, welcome. Hi. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like I'm, I'm being nice and waiting for gadgets to sit, but I'm just taking a break. <laughs> I'm drinking my water. <laughs> People think, oh, Ming is so nice, but no. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. How do you learn emotional intelligence? It turns out that you cannot learn emotion just by reading a book, right? You can learn about EI, but you cannot learn EI. In the same way, there's an analogy. The analogy is the gym, right? Exercise, working out. You can learn about getting fit, but the only way to get fit is to do it, right? Is, is uh, uh, exercising. So therefore, to acquire emotional skills require training. Right? Just like to acquire uh, muscles, requires training. Question then is, what are we training? We are training the brain. Uh, we can do that because of something called neuroplasticity, which is the discovery that what you do, what you think, and what you pay attention to changes the structure and functions of our brains, even for adults, even for engineers. Right? <laughs> the most important part is, is attention. What you pay attention to changes the structure of your brain. And that is how we can acquire e uh, emotional and mental skills, by, changing, by training our brain with our attention, which I'll talk about soon. Which leads us to another question. Uh, oh, by the way, and this is a very important insight, the insight that even adults and even engineers can train their brains. Which leads us again to the next question, which is, how do you train emotional intelligence? Turns out, all you need is three easy steps. Step one, oh, three easy steps. Step one is attention training. Step two is uh, self-knowledge and self-mastery. And step three is to create mental habits. And I, I will talk about this uh, uh, in some details. Oh, by the way, the cartoons you see on the slides, they're the cartoons in the book. Yeah. So the book has cartoons. And I know I was, I was writing like, I, was, I told myself, if I'm writing a serious book about emotional intelligence and, and mindfulness, 
It has, it has cartoons, right? And whoever heard of a serious book without cartoons? Right? So this is, this is why I did that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the first step is this, is training attention, which is counterintuitive, right? If we, if we talk about attention, it's like you come to a class that calls itself an emotional intelligence class. What has attention got to do with emotional intelligence? Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So here is where it makes sense. The attention we're talking about is to basically create a quality of mind, which is this, which allows you to be calm and clear at the same time on demand. So the idea is to develop your mind, develop your attention to such a, such a degree that whatever situation you're in, right, whether you're just hanging out, speaking in front of the public, or like you're under stress, the customer's shouting at you, Right, you have deadlines, the bosses are like looking at you, and you can drop into the state where your mind is calm and clear at the same time on demand. And that, my friends, that is the foundation of emotional intelligence. And again, the good news is this is highly trainable. Again, this is to a question. Yeah, it's highly trainable. How do you do this? How do you train this quality of mind? Turns out it's very simple. I mean, it's embarrassingly simple. It is uh, through a technique called mindfulness. And you're going to define mindfulness and you're going to laugh at me because it's so embarrassingly simple. It's this. Mindfulness, oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Mindfulness is paying attention, but not just paying attention. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's it. That is mindfulness, right? And it's, it's so embarrassingly simple that I, we can even like do it in, in a couple of seconds. So I'm going to invite everybody to do a 10-second exercise. And it's, it's, it's very, very simple. All you have to do is to bring a gentle attention to, the, to your breath, the process of breathing, whatever that means to you. And then if attention wanders away, just bring it back very gently. That's it. We're just going to do 10 seconds, which is one breath. Okay. Easy, right? Even an engineer can do that. Okay? So I'm, but because I'm an engineer, I'm going to time 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 10 seconds, attention to the breath beginning now. Very gentle attention to the process of breathing. And if your attention wanders away, just bring it back. That is all. And that was 10 seconds. It, easy. So easy, anybody can do this. The, so that's the embarrassing part. The hard part is doing this, uh, being able to deepen the mind of mindfulness, like calm and clear. Deepen it and to bring it out on demand and to stay in it for as long as you want. So that's the hard part, right? The easy part is we know what it is. We can all bring about it in 10 seconds in a, in a, in a semi-controlled environment where there's like nobody fighting each other or, or something, right? But it's, it's easy. You might ask a question, which is a valid question. It's, a, it's, it's what I call the WTF question, which is, it sounds so embarrassingly easy. What good can it possibly do, right? It's like, you bring attention to breathing. You bring, yeah, like, like, what good can this possibly do for you? It turns out uh, it does wonders. And here's the analogy, the, the physical exercise analogy. What you just did is the equivalent of me telling you, giving a dumbbell and just doing this once. It's like, sounds stupid, right? You take a heavy object, you lift it, you put it down. Like, what can that possibly do for me? It turns out that if you do this enough, you develop strength. And then once you develop strength, you realize that you can do things that you can never imagine before you were strong. Right? So a simple thing like this, a simple practice done repeatedly over, uh, so practice over a, a long stretch of time changes you. That is the power of mindfulness. So uh, then, okay, so what does it do? What does it change you? A couple of things. The first change you realize if you practice a lot of mindfulness, very, like I say, very simple technique, bring attention to the breath, so on. The first effect is you, you find the perception changes. The, specifically, the quality of your perception changes. Right? You see things in more, 
clarity, especially specifically the process of emotion, the process of thought. You can see it in clarity, but I'll talk about it in a, in a, a bit more uh, detail. Uh, the second thing it does, uh, so it, it sharpens the mind, increases the quality of the attention, and it calms the mind. Right? So this practice doing done often enough, once you gain mastery over it, in the middle of stress, you can just bring attention to the breath, and your mind gets calm, like easily. And then people think that you're like, wow, nothing can bother you, right? It's not true. Things bother you, but you calm yourself on demand. So what's the proof? So there's this study done. Uh, this is one of the earlier studies done on, on uh, fMRI studies done on uh, highly, highly achieved, highly enlightened monks. So like, like the monks we have in our audience today. People with between 10 and 50,000 hours of meditation training. And this involves a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is a very special part of the brain. The amygdala, uh, it has to do with emotion. It's especially active when you perceive a threat. So it doesn't have to be real, right? You just have to perceive it. So, so examples of perception of threat. One example, if you see a saber-toothed tiger running at you, now that's perception of threat, right? Another perception of threat is when your boss comes to you and say, Ming, we need to talk. <laughs> Crap, you know? That perception of threat, the amygdala lights up, right? Interesting thing about the amygdala is that it, it has a very privileged position in the brain, which is that when it activates, when it perceives threat, it takes over. And the way it takes over is that it shuts down the executive part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex over here. So, so you almost, not literally, yeah, you, you almost literally stop thinking. Like you just react. And then retroactively say, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't believe I just said that to the boss. Right? I, just, I just told the boss to go do whatever. Right? <laughs> I don't, I don't that. And then you tell yourself, I wasn't thinking. Or it turns out neurologically, you were not thinking, like for real, literally. So that mechanism has been around for like millions of years. And it's there for a good reason. It helps you survive, right? If you see a saber tooth tiger running at you, you don't want to think. You don't want to say, is that dangerous? Should I Google this? Wait a minute, Google hasn't been invented. This sounds like a problem. Right? You don't want to go through that. You're just like, oh crap, run. Right? So that's how the mechanism works. Unfortunately, it has like negative consequences for, for what we have today. Because if a, a middle triggers all the time, not very healthy. Causes problems. Especially if you're shouting at the boss. Career limiting. <laughs> However, the question then is, is it possible to downregulate something as primitive as the amygdala? Well, of course not. It sounds stupid. It turns out the answer is yes, right? Accomplished monks like the gadgets we have, they can do this. And it's shown in fMRI that they can downregulate something as primitive as the amygdala. And the more practice they have, the more effectively they can do that. It is fascinating. Which was, this was one of the beginnings, the birth of neuro, content, contemplative neuroscience. One of our first glimpses into the mind of a meditator from fMRI. One of the objections, if you see the graph, is that, yeah, this is like 10,000 hours of training. I don't have 10,000 hours to meditate, right? Uh, happily, so again, like good news and better news. Good news is this works. Better news is that it turns out you do not need 10,000 hours. The latest research I, I've seen is, anybody want to guess? Those who haven't been to my class, by the way. Anybody want to guess how short, it, how little time it takes to have a measurable effect? Okay, no guesses. I'll tell you, 100 minutes, like slightly more than an hour. 100 minutes is all it takes for you to begin to have a measurable effect, for your life to begin changing. Like fascinating stuff. Um, okay, let me see. I'm not delay them. Okay, so this is step one. Step one is attention training. Um, mindfulness. Another way to see mindfulness is is this. It is like. Your mind is like a flag, right? Fluttering in the wind, in, in motion or in distress. And mindfulness is like a flagpole that in this case literally grounds the mind. And this is how you can remain under stress and you're stable at the same time. So this is one way to look at mindfulness. So this is step one, uh, attention training. So what is step two, right? Step two is self-knowledge and self-mastery using attention. So what does that mean again? 
So let's begin with a picture. I'm going to show you a picture. OK. If you look at this picture, like there's no, you don't know what this, what this says. Right? However, if we do two things to the picture, the first thing we do is we increase resolution. Okay. The second thing we do is we increase uh, vividness. Well, in, in this case, vividness means brightness and contrast. What happens? If you do that, <coughs> excuse me, you find that you have useful information that was hidden from you before. Right? In this case, right, yeah, it's, for those who can't see, it's like Colonel Sanders trying to hide the, the recipe of, of chicken. <laughs> if not for Colonel Sanders, you can see the recipe already right now. <laughs> so the equivalent the, of, of the analogy is this, is in the mind, when, when your attention becomes, when you have training in mindfulness, your attention not just becomes calm, it also becomes sharp, right? High, and what that means is, is two things. First thing it does for you, it increases the resolution at which you perceive the process of emotion. What does it mean? So resolution is on two dimensions. There's a spatial dimension and a temporal dimension. Spatial dimension means that you're able to perceive changes in the emotional process that you never noticed before. Right? Uh, for example, to make it substantial, you begin able to see, or uh, later, uh, temporal resolution is the ability to see changes in small deltas in time. Combined together, to make it substantial, it means, for example, the ability to see an emotion the moment it is arising, and to see the emotion the moment it is ceasing, and all the tiny changes in between. The mind acquires that ability. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> Oops. Okay. We're back to this. So, so that's what it does for you. It, cr it creates. Uh, also, that's, so that's resolution. What is vividness? Vividness is when you increase your signal to noise ratio. Right. Parts of the emotional process that was almost hidden from you, you begin to see it in clarity. So combined, you begin to get useful information about yourself. And and what does that mean substantially? Substantially, it means that you begin to see yourself objectively from a third-person perspective. Right? Instead of seeing your emotion going like going wow, I can see this anxiousness, this anxiousness from, from, from Chief's point of view. So ah, this is why why it's like to have certain experience of emotion. Rather than I'm experiencing it, I see it objectively. The way that works is uh, it has to do with the insula. So there are parts of the brain here on both sides called the insula. And they are related to a few things. The first thing they are related to is awareness of bodily sensations, especially visceral sensations, sensations inside the chest and the stomach. The second thing is correlated to is awareness of emotion. Right? And the third thing, surprisingly, is, is empathy. So people with strong um, uh, uh, insula are, are strong in all three, all three uh, dimensions. And it turns out the insula can be trained. Right? It's, it's very easy. All you have to do is to bring attention to the body. That's all. Right? And if you do that a lot, every time you do that, you strengthen the insula a little bit more. And if you do that a lot, you become very aware of, of yourself or your emotion. The question then, again, is what does that do for you? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm aware of I'm feeling angry, anger the moment it rises, whatever, right? There are a couple of very uh, uh, useful things. And they're so useful that the degree of self-awareness that you can gain can create profound changes in your life. So let me give you some example. The first example is that if you're able to perceive an emotion the moment it is arising. That gives you the power to turn it off if you want to. It gives you choice, right? Therefore, you have a choice of, hmm, I feel anger arising. Should I be angry or should I be not? You can choose. I mean, there were situations where I chose to be angry, right? And because I was getting ripped off, and I figured the best reaction is to protect other people. If I get ripped off is to like, become genuinely angry, my face turning red and banging on the table. 
And then the situation is like, nah, I don't want to be angry, this, especially since she's my boss. <laughs> Let's turn it off. Right? So you have choice. So the first thing, already, this is life changing. If you have the ability to turn off uh, anger, already that changes your life. That's one. It gets better. Another example is that if you have a lot of strong self-awareness, emotional awareness, the emotional awareness translates into self-assessment. Right? You get to know yourself a bit better. You get to know your resources. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm bad at. This is my strengths, these are my weaknesses. This is what I really like to, like to do. This is what makes me happy and so on. And the effect of that is that once you are able to figure out, quote unquote, your deepest values and motivations, then you know what opportunities to look out for. And that could change your life. So for example, let's say you are good at coding, right? So you know, writing code makes me happy. But suppose that you took SIY, and then you, you, you know something beyond that. You know that beyond writing code, something else makes me happy, which is connecting people. Let's say, just an example. If you, if you, have, if you discover that, that uh, motivation in yourself, then when Google started a, a project called Google Plus, what do you do? You say, oh my God, this is what I want to work on. This is it, right? So if you did not have the insight, the opportunity will just come and go. However, because you have the insight, you catch the opportunity when it's there. And therefore, you're always successful. Right? And then people will think you're very lucky. Right? So I mean, you're lucky, but at the same time, you're there to catch your opportunities. And you're able to catch your opportunities because you have deep knowledge of self. So that's another example of what it, how it changes your life. Very simple practices changing your life. There's a third one, which is even more profound, which is this. If you experience an emotion, we like to think that our emotions are existential experiences. Right? What does that mean? We like to think that the, ex the emotion itself is us. And it, it reflects in the language that you use. For example, we say, I am angry. I am sad. I am happy, right? So the emotion becomes me. I become the emotion. However, as the power of your mind, the sharpness of your mind, your resolution, your vividness becomes stronger over time, you discover something about the process of emotion, and then you reframe the emotion in a very subtle way that quite profound changes in your life. And that profound change is this. It's going from existential to experiential, which means going from I am angry to I'm experiencing anger. I'm experiencing happiness or sadness or whatever. And what does that change? So now it changes from I am this, this is me, to my mind is like the sky, right? And then emotions are like clouds occupying the mind, but they're not the mind. So that's a powerful shift. But wait, it gets better, right? For only 9.99, no, wait, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Which is there's another step you can go as, as your attention becomes even more refined, there is, you discover something else beyond being experiential. You discover that the process of emotion, the experience of emotion is physiological, right? You experience emotions in the body. Every emotion has a bodily correlate. And then you discover something. You discover that painful emotions are not that different from painful feelings in the body. For example, like, I hurt my hand, ah, right? And then it's like, I know this is pain. I know this, this is unpleasant, but the pain is not me. It is a sensation in my body. And having that perceptive, perception changes everything because, because it's not me, I can do things about this, right? I can take Tylenol, I can massage, I can put in ice, or I can ignore it, or I can experience it mindfully or I can just eat ice cream and forget all about it, and so on, right? There are things I can do because this experience is not me. It's just an experience in my body. And that is the power of, of this, oh, we already put it up, okay. Of this change in perception or framing from existential to physiological. And this is one of those insights that, will change, that can change your life. And one of, just one of many in search inside yourself to, to change your life. So, so that is uh, part two, which is uh, self-knowledge and self-mastery. 
and you might think this is it, this is emotional intelligence. But wait, there's more. It gets better. So that's step three. By the way, everything I say is, is a, like incremental improvement. So if you only do one, it's already like huge, right? Then you do a second one, it's, it's even huger. Yeah. And now it's hugest, huger, huger. <laughs> Which is creating mental habits. I say useful mental habits, but specifically, they are habits that are, con that are conducive for social skillfulness. Uh, what does that mean? Let me give you a few examples. The first habit that is very con conducive to, to being socially skillful is the habit of kindness or loving kindness. And that's a habit of looking at any human being, anyone you've, ever, you've never met before. Look at any human being, my first thought is, I want this person to be happy. Right? I want this person to be happy. This is it. Already, you can imagine, if you have that mental habit, right, coming effortlessly, it changes everything. Right? You go into a meeting room, you look at everybody, you think, I want all these people to be happy. It reflects unconsciously in your body, your face, your, your language, your tone, your voice, your, your facial expression. And because it reflected unconsciously, it's picked up unconsciously by the other person. And their feeling, their, their perception is, I like this person. I don't know why. This main guy, I really like him. Maybe it's his good looks, I don't know. Right? <laughs> But it's not just the good looks, right? It's, it's because I'm wishing for this person to be happy. I want Tara to be happy. And Tara can sense it like unconsciously. So in, in the situation like meetings and so on, if you have that mental habit all the time, people want to work with you. And then you find yourself becoming successful. And it, it's not clear why. But it's, it's this. It's just simple things like that. So here's one example. The other example is the habit of human similarity. Right? The habit of looking at human beings and thinks this person is just like me. But in, in three specific dimensions, by the way. Not, I mean, every way, right? I mean, it's not like, like Chip and I who are like, like, we're so alike, only our moms can tell us apart. Not, not like that, right? Um, just like me, three dimensions. The first is looking at any human, oh, especially in a situation of conflict. This is very useful. Looking at any human being in a situation of conflict, this is a human being, just like me. This person wants to be happy, just like me. This person wants to be free from suffering, just like me. This is it. Three things. Three things alone can do wonders. It changes in the situation of conflict. It changes how you react. It changes how you solve the problem. I mean, it creates a possibility of solving a problem. It changes everything at work, makes you successful. So just a cartoon to show. The, so that was the right way to do just like me. So a wrong way to do just like me would be obey this. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> so be, be, beyond talking, I want to do some, create some things that we can bring home today that are useful for you already. So the first useful practice is mindfulness, right? Bring attention to the breath, letting, uh, if there's distraction, let it go. I want to uh, introduce you a very simple second practice. Again, it's one of those 10 second practices that if you do a lot, it will change your life. And the practice is a random intention of kindness. And the idea is look at any human being at random and think, I want that person to be happy. That's it, right? So, so uh, if you want to, I want to invite you to participate, participate. In the next 10 seconds, look at two random human beings in this room and just think to yourself, I want this person to be happy. OK, 10 seconds. No, don't say it, just think it. Oh, this is it. Kind of fun, right? <laughs> kind of fun. I mean, first it changes your life. You do that a lot. But, but beyond changing your life, you, you might find that the intention that you want other people to be happy is intrinsically rewarding. Right? And I think it has to do with our evolution, right? Be, being ultra social beings, like wanting other people to be happy, creates the conditions for ultra sociality, for, uh, for our tribe to survive. So, so try this a lot, right? When you walk out this room, Every, like, I don't know, every hour or so, just look at a random human being and say, I want that person to be happy. Like, like really like, think of that thought and make it a habit. Oh, by the way, everything I just told you, these are informal practices, and they are like ways, they're formal practices to make them even better. So read a book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, the question, why, is, why does this matter? I mean, yeah, I, I, I wish for people to be happy, helps me success, succeed. Why does it matter? It matters especially if you are a manager, 
if you are a leader. And there was a study which I found fascinating, which uh, was published in O3, and it showed this. So in the study, they, they compared a bunch of uh, managers, they ranked them by effectiveness, and they compared the most effective top 25% of managers in the company with the bottom 25%, and figured out what difference rates between them. It turns out in that study, there's only one difference, which is affection, which is the top managers, they, they love people and they want to be loved. And somehow that makes them even more effective. And it turns out there's a simpler explanation, which is if people love you, they will work harder for you. That's it, right? The quality of the work improves, right? So, but now we have the data. So it, shows, it turns out that being loved is good for your career, especially if you are the boss. You say, yeah, 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 sounds good, but they are I'm sure they're limiting situations, right? I'm sure it doesn't work in the, in the US Navy. It turns out in the US Navy, and this was a study back from 1988, <laughs> a study on what makes the best naval commanders. And you think naval, people in Navy, they, they give orders, make it so, engage, fire, right? <laughs> go, wash the, go wash the toilet, no. <laughs> You would think that half people, that half guys, that they don't do, they don't do nice, right, and so on. Well, it turns out, according to this study, this is a famous study, even in the navy, being nice works. So, so here's the description of of the the most effective naval commanders in in the in the U.S. They are described as more positive, outgoing, emotionally expressive, dramatic, warmer, more sociable, appreciative, and trustworthy, and so on. In other words, these are nice, nice people, people you want to hang out with. And the title of this study is Nice Guys Finish First. Yeah. So even in Navy, and just to reinforce the point again, I'm a comic. Nice guys in the military. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it. It's very simple. How to train emotional intelligence? Three easy steps. And you come to SIY, this is it. In seven weeks, we go through this in, in detail, of course. But these are the three basic steps. Uh, so our hope is that when we train emotional intelligence, it helps you uh, become more successful. It helps you become a better leader. And I think more importantly, I think most importantly, at least to me, is to create the conditions for happiness. And happiness, I, I really like this definition which is a deep sense of flourishing that arises from an exceptionally healthy mind, not a mere pleasurable feeling, a fleeting emotion, or a mood, mood, but an optimal state of being. And this is from Matthew Ricard, who is known as the happiest man in the world, but there's a story behind that, which I'll tell you when we have time. But this is it, right? What you learn, the, the emotional skills you learn in such and such, or, and in general, the emotional skills the skill for self-awareness, the skill for mastery over self, the skill for loving kindness and compassion. Ultimately, what it does is this. It creates the condition for happiness for everybody. And I want to create a happy world. So that's what I do. Uh, so let me see, there's some more minutes. So does it actually work, right? We've been running this in Google for about five years. Uh, the most the, the, the feedback we get over and over again, which most warms my heart, is this. Oh, not, not a circle. <laughs> the thing inside the circle. <laughs> which is, your class changed my life. That's very powerful, right? I mean, imagine coming to work on a Monday in the office, and then you take a class in the office, and it changes your life. And just simple things like what we talked about, like awareness, empathy, and so on. So, uh, there, are, there are different ways people's lives have been changed. So some people say, uh, some, some, some of it is, is purely like, like career-wise, like I got my promotion because of SIY. Right? I, I give me the skills that got me my, my promotion. Some people say, I was going to leave Google. And then during SIY, I discovered I love my work. I decided to stay. And then people who say, you know, uh, my marriage became better. I, some people say, I see myself through kinder sets of eyes. I see people with more kindness. Like profound changes in seven weeks. So, like, warms my heart. Uh, so the last, the last part of this talk is the question of why did I do this? Right? How did Search Inside Yourself begin? Embarrassingly enough, it began with world peace. 
search inside yourself started because I wanted to create the conditions of world peace in my lifetime. And the way it started was uh, we have this thing called 20% time project. Right? For those of you watching on TV, uh, engineers, at least in my days, when I, when I was a young man, <laughs> we could spend 20% of our time working on whatever project we wanted. And I figured since I can do whatever I wanted, I might as well solve the toughest problem I know, which is world peace. Right? I mean, like mining asteroids, like, anybody can do that. Right? <laughs> world peace, that is tough. Right? So I started thinking to myself, like the first question asked, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for world peace? I figured something out. I figured that there are two conditions which are necessary, each one insufficient, but combined may be sufficient. The first is the end of global poverty. The second is inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion on a global scale. And combined, I think they are necessary and sufficient. And then I figured since Gates and the, other, the rich guys are working on the first one, the second one, nobody's working on it, I'll work on it. How do I do that? And then after a few months, I figured it out. I figured out that the way to create inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion worldwide is to align it with the success of individuals and businesses. Right? If, you can, if you can create those qualities in ways that help people succeed at work, that help business bottom lines, it's going to spread. Like if it's just about goodness, then yeah, it's kind of nice. Yeah, go, go hug a tree, right? <laughs> but if it's like this thing, this thing, it will help you get your next three promotions and it will earn the company a lot of money. Oh, oh by the way, it will create world peace. <laughs> okay, so where do I sign up, right? So, so the idea, uh, there, there's, a, there's a word for it. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking out right now. Upaya, skillful means, which means that to do something good, right? Do what align with the people's self-interest in the way that the goodness is a necessary and unavoidable side effect. So help people succeed in a way where world peace is the unavoidable side effect. That was what I'm trying to do. Good, how do I do that? And then a couple of months of thinking, I figured it out. I figured out the way to do that is to create a curriculum for emotional intelligence for adults. And that was how SIY started. That was the story. So SIY, Search Inside Yourself, started or began with the story of one funny little engineer uh, and his pursuit for world peace. <laughs> and I hope that this story uh, will have a funny and happy ending. Right? Yeah, it's about world peace. Yeah. So I, I, hope for the, I hope for the happy ending. Um, so I set out to write a book. Can, oh, can I borrow it? I'm going to hold it up. So I set out to write a book that is funny and practical. And I hope uh, life-changing for the readers. And there are a few people who told me it's, it's life-changing, just the book alone. Uh, I hope you like the book. And more importantly, I hope you will change your lives. And I hope all of you will, con will aspire to create the conditions for world peace in your lifetimes too. And thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Any questions? Uh, I guess, do we, need, uh, do we need to use a mic? Yeah. Okay, yes, please use a mic. Oh, we have 13 minutes. That's good. Yes. If I imagine you being happy, mm -hmm. I imagine Me you too. doing some recreational activity, maybe watching a football game, mm -hmm. and taking large amounts of your recreational drug of choice, let's suppose it's beer. <laughs> I must be doing it wrong. Um, if I imagine you being happy, or most people being happy, just being made happy with the smallest change, I imagine them being completely contented and useless. And mm. I, I'm, I don't, I'm <laughs> I, I don't think I want to do that. That's right. Yeah, me neither. Uh, so I tell you my experience, which may or may not be universal, but I, I think it's universal, which is that I, I discover for myself that if I'm in pursuit of happiness, then I'm just doing happiness. I'm not, I'm, something's holding me back from greater service. However, if I'm already happy and I feel that I'm free to contribute, and that's how I feel that I can go out and try to change the world. And because if I succeed, I don't gain anything. If I fail, I don't lose anything. And therefore, I'm free to try. And so, so for me, right, having uh, 
a source of happiness that is not dependent on sensual input. Having that was actually freeing and frees me to do big stuff <laughs> rather than the other way around. Yeah. Of course, I don't mind playing golf too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you. I have two kind of questions. Uh -huh. It's really not challenging you. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. You're so but wise. You ask me questions, I feel humble. This, this is something <laughs> that I myself had experienced during my visits here and there. Mm -hmm. One is that, uh, for example, the talk that you had given right now is really enlightening and wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I do similar kind of talks also. So what I normally find is that, that these kind of beautiful talks that we are giving, mm -hmm. and those who come to listen to these wonderful talks are already good people. <laughs> so the, the question is, how can we reach to the mm. dictators, the totalitarian and selfish, arrogant people who, who doesn't care about any of these things? Right. And many of these people have the power to destroy. Right. So, so this is one question. The second thing is, like the many wonderful activities done by Google or many other companies, I mean, this is really amazing, you know? I, I'm completely amazed by the innovative that you have here. But again, here the problem is the fruit of all these things that you know, great companies do, they seem to be, again, enjoyed by educated and rich people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go anywhere on a larger scale to the right. really, really downtrodden people. So uh, I would like to hear your wisdom on this too. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the, the, first, the first, uh, first thing to know that I don't have any wisdom. I'm just trying my, I'm just trying my best. <laughs> but having said that, so, so, uh, so uh, the, the first question about reaching the people who are least, uh, uh, what's, what's the word, Sub, uh, not susceptible, the least, least receptive to this, which is why upaya is so important, skillful means, right? If it's all about, let's, let's bring goodness to the world. I think like people in this room and people in Google, they say, yeah, sign me up, but there are people who will not sign up. But if it's about profits, that's when I want to hook people to sign up. Like everybody wants to make more money, especially those that are least receptive to goodness. However, if the, if the money comes with being good, it's money, right? Okay, I'll be good. So, so that's my hope. Uh, how about reaching people, at, at the, the, the downtrodden people? Uh, right now, I don't know. Uh, I, I have, I have a, a theory and and I'm going to, since you're Buddhist, I'll express it in Buddhist terms. Uh, and, then, and then I'll translate it to, 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 real, to the real world terms. The Buddhist terms is, is that I think America, uh, like Google in general, and I mean, Google in particular in California and so on, we are heaven. And I hope that through the work that we do, we turn heaven into pure land, right? So, so we, in other words, for, for those who didn't understand what I just said, we transform a place of pleasure and happiness into a, a source of goodness for the, for the rest of the world. So, so, so for those who know that Pure Land is not a place where you're happy, Pure Land is a place where you practice and become compassionate and enlightened. Right. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that through the work that we do, that compassion will spread at least in America, and through that, the world will benefit in some good way. I'm just guessing, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, this question is about reaching a, another group of people. Mm -hmm. Can you write one for my 10-year-old son? <laughs> uh, maybe. How do we reach children? Maybe. I, I am not, I, I don't know. I think this book may be uh, readable by 10 years old already. Let, let me know. Okay. Yeah. So I'll try. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually thinking of writing a children's book, but it will not be as deep as this. So, okay. so yeah. Get them started. Okay. Get them started. That's a good thing. Thank you. You, you almost answered the question, actually, just now, but... I still, uh, maybe you have some other thoughts on this. You, um, uh, is there n no hope for people to actually realize that happiness is the value by itself, not through a career advancements or money? Mm -hmm. Is there no hope at all in you mm -hmm. to, to let people, to help people understand that happiness is mm -hmm. the value by itself? Uh, uh, I think there's a lot of hope. And, and I, I'll tell you how optimistic, how naively optimistic I am, Kenneth. I'm so optimistic that that topic, right, that there is a, a source of happiness accessible to normal human beings with mental training. And that source of happiness is independent of sensual pleasure. I'm so optimistic it's in chapter three. <laughs> it's near the beginning of the book. So, so I do think it is doable and I think 
given the right way the message is spoken, right? Spoken with signs, spoken tangibly, and not just, oh, you're all happy, but like this is a, these are the specific practices, this is what it does to you, and this is and so on. Spoken in the right language with the right, with the right data, I think it can reach masses and I think people will get it. I hope. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I keep stealing your books. Yeah, good thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of scary to take things from monks because they know Kung Fu or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so if you see, if you like, like see me like. <laughs> and then, yeah. You promised a story about the happiest man of the world. If there is enough time, is there enough time? Oh, there is enough time. Okay, since there's nobody behind you, I'll tell the story. Uh, so the story is, it, it turns out that neurologically, there is a way to measure happiness, which is very surprising. And it's a very simple way, which is they measure the relative activation of the left prefrontal cortex over here, a specific part of the, and then versus the right prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. And it turns out that if the left, the left right tilt, if it's more left than right, the person respond uh, the first person experience is I'm happy, I'm optimistic, I'm joyful, and so on. Positive stuff. And the more the gradient, the more positive the person uh, reports. And vice versa. Right. Why is that so? Uh, nobody knows for sure, but there is a very important clue, which is only the left prefrontal cortex here has a direct connection to the amygdala. So only that part has able to like, like tone down the negativity. And this part doesn't have that. And it's not, it's not clear why. But so, so there is a relationship. And this data has been around long enough, has been studied for long enough, that there is a normal curve that's been established of, of what most people look like in you know, the distribution. And Matthew Ricard, when he was measured, he was like a couple of standard deviations away from the mean. Right? So, so at that time, he was like the happiest person ever measured by science. And again, that's the good news. But again, that's better news. The better news is that it turns out he was not the only one. Yeah, so it turns out that as long as you put in your hours of practice, you can reach the state of like, extreme happiness. That is a, that, that is a reason voluntarily without, without sensual input, on demand. Right? And, and I suspect all the geishis uh, can, can have that ability, but they, they, they just don't want to tell you. Yes, they're very humble. They, and they also have kung fu or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they can use the force. <laughs> yes, Joe? Hello, Ming. Thank you so much for this talk. It was very enlightening. Thank you. Um, so if I know that SIY, the Search Inside Yourself course, is offered here at Google. Yes. But if I were a company mm -hmm. that, was, that was really needing the sorts of tools that you're offering in this book, mm -hmm. how would I be able to obtain them if I weren't here at Google? Ah, <laughs> there is good news, which is, uh, <laughs> it sounds like a planted question, but I didn't plant it. Somebody else did. <laughs> If it was a planted question, you ask. You're so good looking. How do you do that? You know? <laughs> okay. The also, to... if I want to look as good as you, how do I do that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Study engineering. <laughs> All the engineers are good looking. Didn't you notice? <laughs> so how do you get access to this outside of Google? We are creating an organization called the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. S I Y L Y is pronounced as silly. <laughs> so silly.org. Yeah, so so we're going to like train trainers and bring this out to the world. So if you are if you are watching this from outside of Google uh, and you're interested, go to silly.org, S I Y L Y dot org, and yeah, and find more information. And I guess that's it. Uh, if nothing else, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being my friends. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you.